and to start talking. They're really loud frogs. <laughs> I was like, as soon as we left, they started back up. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on our woods hike today. We're going to learn a little bit about our woods on Barrier Island, and we're also gonna be talking a little bit about the wetlands that are on Barrier Islands. So my name is Alex, and I'm gonna be leading us today. I am a naturalist here at the Barrier Island Environmental Education Center. And so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So our woods actually um, have a cool history to them. Most woods um, just happen to grow over time, and they get to their full structure that you see here. And ours, of course, done the same thing. But what we're standing on happens to be old sand dunes. So barrier islands are made out of sand, so of course it makes sense that sand would be part of this process as well. But if you look down here, what's underneath my feet is actually just a little bit of topsoil, but it is mainly sand. It's very coarse. It looked like something that you would actually just find on the beach, okay? So some um, leafy material that may be breaking down in it and whatnot. Uh, but for the most part, it is sand. And so the plants and animals that we find here have to be able to live in this kind of environment. Okay? So the three main parts of our forest that we're going to talk about is the canopy. So the part that is above us, um, the part that provides shade as you're walking through, it is the main part where all the leaves are of our very tall trees. Okay? We also have our understory which is where we have some of our shorter trees or our shrubs, um, some low-lying brush. And then of course we have the ground cover. And that's the part that we were just looking at, on um, the part that's at our feet, anything that might be growing across the ground. So we are going to go ahead and get started on our walk. I'm gonna stop us just a couple times before we get to our slough to talk about a cool um, thing that we have going on in our forest here. So come on. So this right here happens to be one of my favorite things um, about just our forest. It's kind of an odd one, so bear with me. But this right here is a palmetto tree, which we'll get to introductions of trees later. But down here at the base of the trunk that we have, you can see that Part of the tree is actually missing. So if this tree was actually filled in, this part would all be trunk. Now, this kind of looks like maybe a beaver was chewing on it. Um, we do not have beavers on Barrier Island, so it's not a beaver. And it's also not termites. Um, it's not ants. It's not even me coming out here for a snack before I got the video started, okay? This is actually beaver rot fungus. And so what happens is that this fungus starts eating away at the tree um, at the bark and in some some point this tree will fall over because obviously it's missing part of its trunk. Now the cool thing about palmetto trees is that they're able to endure this for a very long time so this tree has a lot of years left in it. All right so we're gonna keep going. We are moving into a new territory of our woods. 
What you're looking at right now is the start of our slough. Now a slough just means that it is a freshwater pond that is on a barrier island. And the reason why this slough is so significant is that it's actually an oasis or a paradise um, for our animals that live on this island. Now our island is completely surrounded by salt water, okay? whether it's the Atlantic Ocean or the estuary, or even some of our tidal creeks which just have a lot of salt water in them. So this area is one of the few places on our island that we have fresh water for our animals to be able to drink and for our plants to be able to survive on. We're gonna talk about a little bit more about the water when we get out there. But we are gonna stop at this beautiful live oak tree. And we're gonna take a look around at some of the plants that grow on the tree. So one of the cool things about this tree is that we actually have this plant right here. It looks like a fern, and in fact, it is. This is a resurrection fern, and it gets that name from its ability to be able to go from a dormant stage to a living stage. So when we have a lot of rain, which happens a lot in South Carolina, um, this plant will turn bright green and it'll look so alive. But then in between the time that it doesn't rain, it'll actually start to shrivel up and turn brown. It will look dead, but it is in fact actually just dormant or it's, you know, in a way sleeping, I guess. It's preserving the energy that it has. Then when it rains again, within 24 hours, it'll turn bright green again. So of course, resurrection, it looks dead, it's alive. You can see where the name come from. Now, one of the other things that we have growing on our tree here is this one right here. It looks like candy, it looks like bubble gum, but it is not. This is a bubble gum lichen. So it gets that nice, beautiful pink color. And lichen is actually um, a symbiotic relationship between um, algae or cyanobacteri cyanobacteria um, and fungi. And so these two work together by photosynthesizing um, the sunlight and then they grow. And photosynthesizing, um, just to help us remember, is where plants take sunlight and then they store it and then they produce glucose or sugars so that they have energy to continue reproducing. Now, one thing that is very popular about the South, um, and I'd say is you know notorious and it's beautiful and you see it a lot down here, is the Spanish moss. And so it's always hanging in the trees. It looks gorgeous when the sunlight comes through it and you know in the evening time. Um, but like the resurrection fern, it is a plant um, that it grows on other plants. And we have a term for that. They're called epiphytes. So epiphytes are plants that grow on other plants, but don't harm them. So this Spanish moss is actually also a lichen. So it is like our bubblegum lichen. Um, and it doesn't have any roots. It grows up in the trees. It is always climbing towards the sunlight. So wherever you see the Spanish moss, then you know, hey, that's probably where it gets a lot of sunlight because that's what it needs to survive. We're gonna go ahead and keep on walking out into the middle of our slough where we can continue to talk about our trees and maybe some other creatures that you would find in this area. No! We are going to continue on with introducing some of our trees that are very popular in our forest. And we're going to start with the one that has the largest leaves, which is our palmetto tree. 
Now the palmetto tree is the one where I talked about the beaver rot. And so this is actually what is on top of the tree. Now as you can see, this palm frond here is huge. Okay. It's about as tall as me. <laughs> and the reason that it needs such big leaves is because it is actually one of the shortest trees in our forest. And so I'm going to use a term and I'm going to use this for a couple of our other trees as well. This tree right here is shade tolerant, which means that it can handle a lot of shade. And the reason for that is because of the large leaves. It's able to photosynthesize even just the littlest amount of light in order to live. And so these leaves help it survive in that kind of environment. So that tree right there is shade tolerant. The next tree that I'm going to introduce is shade intolerant which means that it does not do well unless it has a lot of light. This right here is part of our loblolly pine. Our loblolly pine is the tallest tree typically in our forest. It is the top dog, if you will. Now you can see that its leaves are actually needles, okay? So they're very small leaves in comparison to our huge palm frond. So it needs a lot of light in order to survive. Now, one of the ways that this tree reproduces is through a pine cone. I'm sure you all are familiar with this. But in our pine cone, this is actually um, a vessel for a lot of little seeds. So if you look inside, you can see that there's little seeds in here. And so when the pine cone hits the ground, um, that action helps release some of the seeds. But of course, we have other things that help um, with seed dispersal, like squirrels. Squirrels love to eat pine cones and they help spread those seeds so that there can be more loblolly pines in our forest. Our next tree is one of my favorites. This is the live oak. This is the tree that we just looked at um, with the fungus and the Spanish moss. But this right here has rather small leaves in comparison to our other ones. They're a little bit larger than the pine needles. Okay. But this guy actually uses the idea of spreading really far out. So live oaks are known for their large branching um, arms. And that way that they can cover a lot of ground to get a lot of sunlight. So they don't necessarily need to be the tallest or have the biggest leaves. Um, they just cover a lot of territory. And if you let them grow large enough, um, they can grow hundreds of feet wide and they can grow to multiple stories tall. And what's neat about that is that they all start in this little tiny acorn. So everything that the tree needs in order to grow and become a big tree is in this little tiny seed. Our last tree that we're going to talk about is our magnolia. Okay, this magnolia is in rough shape right now, um, but it has these large leaves. They're kind of waxy or succulent like. Okay, and they grow in bunches. And so this tree happens to be one of our taller trees as well. And it also uses a pod, it is not a pine cone, but a pod, that will have these ruby red seeds in it during the fall. So when these hit the ground, the seeds will pop out and then you get new magnolia trees. Now they do look like candy um, when the red, red uh, po seed pods are in there, um, but don't eat them because they're toxic. <laughs> So we're going to move on to some of the creatures that you could find out in this area. We have a number of amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds that all live in the surrounding area. We've got alligators and turtles and birds um, that are really big and we got the little ones that you'll find here. And of course, um, mammals. So we got those turkeys and those deers, but we're going to talk about one that comes out at night. Okay, and no, <laughs> it is not the raccoon or the possum. We're going to talk about the gray fox. So this gray fox here, and it is different than a red fox, okay? You can tell because it has a black tip tail. Very pretty. But this gray fox here, as I said, comes out at night. And so it'd be hard to find um, during the day that you might just stumble across, which is kind of why they make such a cool creature. Is you don't get to see them very often. So when you do see one, it's kind of a special event, okay? So if you wanna look closely at this fur, um, he spends his time hunting at night, which typically could be cooler than the daytime. 
Okay. And so he has to have a way in order to protect himself from the cool nights, but then also a way to just protect himself as he's traveling about through the woods. So if you look at the black and white hairs, these are actually kind of coarse. And that just means that they're a little bit stiffer. And they help keep the mud and dirt and leaves and things that might stick to him off of him. But when I push up on this and I go backwards, you can see that there's little brown hairs and they're really downy. They're very soft. Um, they kind of are similar to what you'd find inside of a winter jacket that's really puffy. Those feathers that sometimes come out, okay? And so that downy layer is what keeps him warm. So this dual layer coat is able to help the fox go about his fox ways. Now, of course, I said he comes out at night, but if you were to spot one of these, one place that you could find them is maybe in their den, maybe hunting, or you could find them out on a tree. So these foxes are part of the canine family, and they're one of the few canines that can actually go up a tree, if it's at an incline, they can climb up the tree, and then they can also walk down the tree backwards. You can train some dogs like German Shepherds to do that, um, but it's not their natural instinct to climb up and down trees. Only gray foxes can do that, which is pretty cool. Now, we are gonna look at the skull real fast. And this is a fake one, don't worry. Okay. Um, but you can see that here would be where its eyes are at. So it has big eye sockets because it needs to be able to see at night. So it has beautiful big eyes. This is where its nasal cavity would be so that the scent and smell can come in and it's able to track down food. And then of course, the teeth. And I did say this was part of the canine family. So of course it has some beautiful large canine teeth. Now this guy, he does not eat his food whole. And in fact, he is an omnivore. So he eats both plants and animals. So these canine teeth help tear at food and then once it gets a size that it's able to swallow, then it just swallows that piece. Humans have more of molars in the back of their mouths. They're these wide, broad teeth that are in the back, you know. Um, and we use those to grind up our food and then we swallow. But our canine here, friend, he actually just has these little tiny little molars, but for the most part, he's using them to tear his food into small enough pieces that he can just swallow. You might say he'd be kind of a rude dinner guest. Now, as I mentioned before, this area here, this slough, um, provides fresh water for our creatures. So I'm gonna get us a drink real fast. And you can see, maybe you really wouldn't wanna drink that, according to the color at least. But I don't know how many of you are sweet tea fans. I'm a sweet tea fan. Um, but just like how you put a tea packet into your water and then the tea stains um, the water so that it turns a nice brownish red color and then you have sweet tea afterwards. The same thing goes for our water. We have lots of leaves surrounding our area right now. And so those leaves will fall into the water and they will stain the water. And this process, um, the way that the leaves stain the water is called tannins. And so it's literally tanning the water. Imagine laying out in the sun, you get really tan, okay? Just the way that the leaves fall into the water, it's tanning, <laughs> tanning the water. So this water is fresh, and in fact, this water is actually very clean. I know it doesn't look that way, but it is. The way that this pond gets its water is through rain or through um, water that comes over the surface of the land. So when it rains a lot and it kind of all flows to the lowest point. And speaking of rain, we're having just a little bit of it, okay? So. That is how our water gets to this area. And as it's traveling across the soil and through the mud and things like that, it's actually being filtered. And so this water ends up being very clean. Now you may be wondering um, what this green stuff is floating on top of the water. And I'm gonna get us a little sample of it. So this right here is called duckweed. And this plant is specially adapted for this environment. The little dots here are actually its leaves. And so that would be what is used to photosynthesize the sun. And then underneath all the little stringy parts that are here, those will be considered its roots. And so those roots um, obviously gather water because even though it's in the water, it still needs to be able to drink. 
and then it also gathers some nutrients that it might need that it doesn't get directly from the sun. Fun fact about duckweed is it's actually pretty high in protein. All right. So we are going to go ahead and just kind of walk around here um, so you guys can get a nice view of this area. It's very beautiful. Um, so that way you have a moment to enjoy it. Um, just like I'm enjoying it right now. All right, thank you so much for joining us today, you guys. I hope that um, you got to learn a little bit more about our woods here at the Barrier Island. And um, I know it was a lot of information at you guys, so if you wanna rewatch the video and you know take notes or whatever, then feel free to do so. Um, of course, please put any of your comments or questions below so that we can address those tomorrow. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye.